Uh, good afternoon from Geneva. Uh, we have today a discussion uh, with four amazing panelists. Uh, it's us, the International Service of Human Rights, um, organizing this uh, together with the B team uh, and the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, as well as the International Commission of Jurists, who will be joining us uh, a little bit later for some for some comments. Um, the occasion today is mainly the launch of the guidance by the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights, uh, especially focused on defenders and the role of states and businesses. So for that today, we have uh, different views that will that will come together in hopefully a nice conversation. I think we have uh, Anita from the UN Working Group joining us today, Anita Ramasastri. Then uh, from the civil society point of view, we have Davis Lothert, coordinator and founder of the Alternative Asian Network on Burma. Hi, Debbie. Joining us right now, Crispin Conroy, who is the permanent representative of the International Chamber of Commerce here at Geneva at the United Nations um, representation. And then from the state uh, perspective, we will have the views from Remy Friedman from the Swiss government joining us today, senior advisor from the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, Human Security and Business. So thanks all for joining. Thanks to all the secretariat of the OECHR for the work on the guidance. Uh, well, to Anita herself, Natasha, John, Graham, and others. And, um, I will just like step aside quickly. We will have like eight minutes each uh, by to provide your, your presentation and your thoughts. Then we will have approximately like 20 minutes for comments and questions uh, on the topic. So I'll step aside. Thanks so much for joining us today. It is being recorded. It will be circulated later. Please put your questions in the Q&A section so we can uh, take note and then reply to hopefully most of them. Um, Anita, the floor is yours. Thanks for coming and whenever you're ready. Great, thank you so much, Andres. And it's actually a pleasure to be on a panel with a with a great group of, of speakers and friends and colleagues. Um, I just want to really briefly share with people that what we hope is going to be good news for all of our allies and colleagues and friends, which is that the working group on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of guiding principles released along with other reports, uh, new guidance on the role of the guiding principles in, 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 in ensuring respect for human rights defenders. It's no surprise to all of us here why we did this. We've actually had a work stream for some time and we have consulted broadly with so many of you, but essentially the working group along with so many other members of civil society have constantly been recognizing as actually I should say my colleagues in special procedures. So of course the special rapporteur and human rights defenders, but many of the other mandate holders have really called out and, and given attention to the fact that risk to defenders increases constantly. But what the working group has done is really highlighted the nexus to business and human rights, that throughout our country visits around the world, across the globe, we have continuously seen this, that businesses have been connected to either causing or contributing or being linked to human rights abuses when human rights defenders are speaking up and speaking out about business related human rights impacts. So that was the starting point for us, that there is this recognized problem and the question is, well, what should we do about it? And we're grateful for the work of ISHR, the Business Network, the B Team, the um, Business and Human Rights Resource Center, you know, for, for keeping this issue on the agenda. But we wanna help you, help civil society, and really backstop what you have already been doing by setting out clear guidance as to what the UN guiding principles do require of states, of businesses and then looking at access to remedy. So just very briefly, and I would just encourage everyone to read the guidance and to use it because it's really meant to be a tool for you to support your efforts with authoritative statements. Pillar one, the role of states. There is much more that can be done by states and we have, evident, we have some examples of good practice around the fact that states need to encourage and require their businesses to respect the rights of defenders. So this is not just about states themselves standing up for defenders, this is making sure that the conduct of the companies that they oversee is also respectful. This means again, tying things like trade support, export credit and other things to companies' performance and behavior, ensuring that there aren't reprisals against defenders, um, it, uh, speaking up, providing certain kinds of support to defenders engaging in host countries, that there are a variety of things. So we have a sort of set a recipe and 10 key steps for states. But most importantly, I think is pillar two and, and what business needs to do. And to some extent, 
it should be simple, but it's really about not only businesses having a strong policy commitment to respect for defenders, but really embedding in human rights due diligence, anticipating the very specific risks and harms to defenders and taking steps to address those. So we really focus on human rights due diligence and what else needs to be done to really think about rights of defenders, but also think about engagement with defenders as those critical allies at the starting point. So due diligence, Second piece is leverage and the role that business needs to take. And I, I think we're going to hear from Bennett Freeman later, but, but about really speaking up uh, as appropriate with the consent of defenders in, in their support. So really using leverage individually and collectively, and then showing support both publicly and privately. And we do talk about you know, how quiet diplomacy in certain circumstances is important. And then finally, access to remedy. Uh, and how companies and states need to, to address those issues as well. I will say that we have some focus areas in the guidance that are important. We really emphasize the important role of national human rights institutions, but we also have a, a spotlight or shine a spotlight on di development finance and international financial institutions, because of course, a lot of reprisals against defenders relate to large scale projects, development projects. And so the role of these development finance institutions is important in having not only policies against reprisals, we found that there are strong policies, but there actually need to be protocols and processes in place when defenders actually suffer from reprisals. So this, I think, is a very important piece of the guidance that we cannot underestimate. So I'll stop there and say again, for us, what we do is we set forth what expectations are, and we hope that that backstops all of the important work of so many of the people on this at, at this webinar today are doing. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anita. That was a, a, a nice, a nice uh, package about the new, the new guidance. And uh, I just uh, forgot to mention that we, we, we work uh, together with the Business and Human Rights Resource Center and the B team on, on some of these issues and the, the business network on civic freedoms and human rights defenders, which has been like trying to test these forward looking uh, practices that now are in validated and, and gathered in this guidance. So we will have to, the chance to speak about that later. Uh, Debbie, please. Uh, Go ahead whenever you're ready, um, bring in the perspective from, from civil society and human rights defenders. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And um, um, uh, congratulations and appreciation to the uh, UN Working Group on issuing this guidance, which is, I think, uh, very much welcome and lo long anticipated. Um, I think uh, the, the reality uh, the reality is that when it comes to UNGPs and other voluntary frameworks, there's still a huge gap and a huge, well, a yawning gap, like a you know Grand Canyon size gap, especially when it comes to states that um, to states where rule of law is weak, where there are very weak regulatory frameworks, and for a reason, and where um, uh, corporations do not wish, uh, they they tend to uh, cherry pick uh, how they do their stakeholder engagement and their human rights due diligence. And, um, and I do appreciate the fact that in this, in this guidance, in financial institutions are uh, specifically mentioned as well. But you know, when we look back and see that this is not just a temporary spike in terms of COVID, having worked in this scene, um, every time there's a spike, the, you know, people say, oh, no, it's just a face. It's not a face. Unless there is a very specific and intentional move by states, allies, and corporations themselves to address these spikes and turn, uh, and turn back the, the, these trends, we're, we're still going to face the, the, the reality that even during the time of COVID, we've had um, a, a high number of slap suits strategic litigation to restrict to against public participation, even as human rights defenders and communities are restricted in their mobility because of COVID. Uh, companies, uh, especially in the extractive industry and agribusiness industries, are actually uh, moving in, signing more deals and making bigger deals. So, um, and even in my country, Malaysia, I work on Burma most of the time, but I am a Malaysian. Malaysian companies, especially engaged in uh, PPE production because of COVID, making tons of money, getting tons of orders, were actually exploiting migrant workers. And actually, to the point, the, 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 the tragic irony that not only were migrant workers being underpaid, 
having wage, being subjected to wage theft, they were working in such conditions that they, they actually uh, had cl a cluster of COVID. So they're working to produce PPEs to prevent the spread of COVID and they themselves was exposed to COVID because of their working condition. So, you know, we have these um, very intense situations and, um, and, and here we see that it's not just about thinking about COVID, it's thinking about the post COVID pressure where businesses, when it's people are trying to return to business as usual, but the states and corporations are trying to, especially corporations that may have suffered, um, reduced, uh, uh, may have had their operations affected by COVID slowdowns, trying to make the gains back, trying to gain back what they were lo they lost, and states themselves trying to gain back um, in terms of revenues, that's going to put even more, uh, uh, more pressure on communities and the human rights defenders that the communities come from, particularly urban poor, um, indigenous people, migrants, um, and land dependent communities. This is where we are seeing um, a lot of the vulnerability. It's not going to go away after COVID. And the weaponization of COVID to bring even more repressive laws, um, there's still going to be a, a huge need for corporations and other states and allies to actually push and work very hard to, to dismantle, to wind back these laws, including in the digital space. In, um, and we haven't even talked about how this will intersect with the pressures created by climate change and, um, and some of the very harmful non-human rights centered mitigation measures we haven't talked about how this intersects with conflict in the, uh, our work on Burma, Myanmar. And basically in the past five months, we've seen um, 3000 conflict incidents targeting civilians on the ground in every part of the country. And the 3000 incidents are actually in, in, in five months um, are horrifying when you understand that there were only 1,000 such, in only, only, now you say it's only 1,000 such incidents for the whole year of 2020. So basically we've got a three year total within uh, five months. And at, in this space, we've had uh, companies trying to pressure NGOs to try and provide some kind of human, help them out with human rights due diligence um, or, or even pressuring um, human rights defenders to, um, to, to step back from um, talking about mandatory human rights due diligence and enhancing human rights due diligence in this time of conflict where there's an illegal junta in power. Um, it, we, we started the, um, uh, some several colleagues and I started the ASEAN Regional Coalition to Stop Digital Dictatorship because in the past 18 months, we've seen a rise in a whole raft of laws and amendments um, by Thailand, Myanmar, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, especially Indonesia coming out with a whole bunch of, of laws. We, in, in Thailand, we actually have two centers to, uh, to, to monitor and surveil the internet in Thailand for um, misinformation about COVID. So we, we, it, there's a lot of overkill, a lot of resources being put into restricting digital space at a time where the digital space has been even more critical to, to, to civic organizations and to community groups. So I, I think we, we do need to understand that Firstly, human rights defenders have to, we need to adopt an intersectional lens because inevitably LGBT, as the, as the guidance uh, acknowledges, uh, women, LGBT, uh, minority groups, uh, migrants, non-citizens non are all people who are incredibly vulnerable uh, as human rights defenders um, to this kind of persecution. So, um, and the other thing too is that uh, it's there is definitely a trust deficit because um, 
NGOs are feeling the pressure to be an offset to human rights due diligence to um, where, where companies and corporate, corporate interests are trying to, um, to outsource human rights due diligence to, to NGOs. And that's not, and that's not acceptable. Um, we can't provide you with the alibi and we can't be your offset. Um, but if you want to rebuild, uh, if you want to rebuild that trust, then there has to be uh, corporations willing to speak out against SLAP and to restrain their, uh, their uh, resorting to, to SLAPs, um, to SLAP cases, to, uh, to, res to restrain themselves in terms of um, exploiting uh, conflict, COVID, and climate change. Uh, what is quite shocking too is that there has been very, there have been very clear instances of corporate capture when we're looking at laws affecting human rights defenders, including um, uh, and, and at, at laws um, and practices and policy, policies in terms of the COVID response and access to vaccines and treatments. So um, a huge amount of uh, issues to raise and understanding that um, at some stage, we do need a legally binding instrument because as uh, Anita acknowledges so well, um, we, we don't have mandatory human rights due diligence. We don't have effective access to remedy and one way to start that, to accelerate that part to oper operationalization is to look at a binding mechanism. Thank you. Thanks so much, Debbie, for uh, such a good overview, and, and it leaves some some questions for the for later. I think um, about the role of business, how they can potentially speak out and be more progressive partners, as well as some of the the, the, the key issues that are happening right now in the sector, including the the smart mix between non-binding and binding uh, solutions or or topics. So let's let's go to our next speaker, and uh, then I think we will have some time for for discussion that will be very interesting. Remy Friedman from the Swiss government joining us uh, today. So thanks, the floor is yours, and whenever you're available. Thank you, Andres. Um, it's uh, thank you also for giving me the privilege and the honor to share this panel with such distinguished speakers and experts such as. Anita, Debbie, and, and Crispin. I'm talking to you uh, from uh, the, here in Bern, Switzerland. Um, I would like to say that um, the guidance that the uh, UN Working Group has produced is very timely and it will help us really translate into practice, uh, contributing to this translation into practice of the commitments we have made through the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights, as well as the guidelines that Switzerland has issued on the protection of human rights defenders. The, uh, the guidelines on the protection of human rights defenders, uh, in their first version, we were released by Switzerland in 2013 as a useful and practical tool for our diplomatic network, which consists of more than 170 representations of broad to support the work of human rights defenders and ensure their protection in a more efficient and systematic manner. Uh, in 2019, uh, new uh, guidelines, revised version was adopted and it reflected more concretely the role of business enterprises, the role of private actors, in particular companies, it, 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 a little more, be, much more better in, uh, into account. The activities of enterprises have uh, an impact on human rights defenders, of course, and if they act in a responsible manner, they can contribute considerably to the protection of human rights defenders. This is uh, mirrored in the National Action Plan, the revised version that Switzerland adopted in 2020, uh, that recognized that human rights defenders are individuals or uh, people who act or endeavor to act at individually or in association with others to promote, protect, and implement human rights, including those arising from adverse impact on the environment. Those working in the field of business and human rights can run the risk of threats or physical attacks. That's why companies should take on board the concern of stakeholders, including human rights defenders who may be affected by their activities. They also should not obstruct the peaceful and legitimate uh, work of human rights defenders. 
how can they contribute actually to this protection is by raising the matter with the authorities, by uh, speaking out, by taking up public commitments. Um, and this is why we, we see that um, this guidance will help us certainly translate into practice what has now uh, become, I would say, a, a role that uh, goes beyond maybe the traditional notion of human rights defenders. Uh, some of them are lawyers, as Debbie said, uh, journalists, uh, others are doctors, simply dedicated citizens who have a commitment in favor of, of, of human rights. And the notion of shared civic space that has been uh, mentioned, which is actually uh, at the onset of this whole uh, discussion, is something that needs to be more and more reiterated now uh, that we are trying to uh, build our way back out uh, of this pandemic and seeing how this pandemic has actually uh, had a really a, an important toll on, uh, I would say, on the on this same civic space and the freedom of expression um, and the authoritative temptations that do also also exist, exist including in the in the digital in the digital space. So and when we talk about shared civic space. As a government, what we're saying is that uh, our expectations that companies respect human rights, we always say that the federal council, the Swiss government, respects Swiss companies to respect human rights wherever they operate, which includes, of, of course, the human rights of human rights uh, defenders. We are also actually talking about a societal expectation. We have had a debate in Switzerland in terms of what would be the best way, in terms of what is the best mark mix between legally binding and non binding. Uh, instruments in terms of uh, carrying out human rights due diligence. There's some legislation coming up uh, that doesn't meet everybody's expectation, but at the same time, there is uh, the realization uh, that um, we all we all live in the same planet. We all share the same civic space. Companies have a business case to respect human rights. We have a business case to engage with stakeholders in a preventative manner, these include human rights defenders. And, that, and we need to meet the expectation of the younger generations that are take, telling us, well, there is no planet B, there is nowhere else, way, where else to go. And uh, if we do not act now altogether, there, there won't be any more business in a, in a, in a few years. So this, this sense of emergency is something that we really feel uh, and um, sharing uh, in the recent days and weeks, uh, similar spaces with companies, uh, what, I, what I could hear uh, was really this commitment of, well, that th there's really the case of really building back better, being more responsible, uh, working with communities, uh, engaging with stakeholders, protecting the legitimate work of human rights defenders. And this is part of our social uh, license to operate. It's, how we can have this legitimacy and meet the expectations of, of, of everyone. So uh, thanks a lot again. Uh, I think these uh, guidance will certainly help us in our dialogue with uh, businesses and, and civil society and other governments. And I'm looking forward to uh, discussions, depending on how much time we still have, so questions and answers. Thank you, Andres. Thanks, Remy. Uh, thanks for bringing the, the discussion also to to the to the to the Swiss uh, territory and the, the new initiatives that are being pushed by this uh, democratic participation here that is so characteristic of this country, um, and thanks for bringing that th those points around the, the civic space and, and and linking them to the sustainable development approach and the the, the the urgency of climate change that I think we will have the chance to discuss later. Let me now. Uh, yeah, pass the floor to uh, Crispin Conroy, who is who is joining us today from the International Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we are really looking forward to hear your views uh, more, let's say, from the perspective of businesses and private sector. So uh, please, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much, Andres, and thanks to you and to the International Service for Human Rights for for well for our ongoing conversations, but also for inviting me here here today. And of course, I'd like to greet my my fellow panelists. Especially Anita, it was great to see you here face to face in Geneva. Such a nice change from the, the many virtual sessions we've been on together in the, in the last few weeks. And as many of you will know, we've been working very closely with Anita and Dante and the, uh, the UN Working Group, particularly around the UN, uh, UNGP 10, 10 plus project. Uh, and we've been, I think, involved in numerous events over the last month together. 
Um, we've been focusing very much in the UNJP context on the next decade uh, and taking implementation to the next level, recognizing that much, much more needs to be done by both business and states. And Anita, we're certainly looking forward to you, working with you and your colleagues on the implementation of the roadmap for the next decade once it's released in October or November. And clearly one of the issues where much more needs to be done is the one we're discussing today, which is how both businesses and states uh, engage with safeguard uh, and ensure respect for the rights of human rights defenders. And thank you, uh, Anita and your colleagues for the, for, for the guidance. Uh, for those who, of you who don't know me, I, I used to work for the Australian government and I was in Geneva in the late 90s working on a number of human rights instruments, including the, the negotiation of the Declaration on Human Rights Defenders. So it's an issue that is part of my past and also very close to my, my heart. First of all, let me say a few words about, about the International Chamber of Commerce. We, we are the World Business Organization based in Paris and we were formed just after the First World War by a group of entrepreneurs who wanted to contribute to rebuilding peace. So within the organization's DNA is, uh, you know, really is, a, is a, a, a desire to contribute to these sorts of challenges and discussions. We were the institutional representative of 45 million companies, small, large and medium in over 110 countries. So really in all, all regions of the world as well. And we're the only business organization currently with observer status at the UN. As I mentioned earlier, we've been very closely associated with the UNGPs uh, uh, initially when they were being drafted and there was through the consultation process, then through impl implementation in our business network, calling on business and states to implement them, including to states through their national action plans. And the primary uh, agent of that work was, was our, our uh, corporate social responsibility anti-bribery commission uh, bringing in business business uh, actors from around the world however icc recently decided to establish uh, an informal business human and human rights working group um, just a, about three months ago i think uh, and i lead that from our office here in geneva the objective of that of that working group is to ensure that we engage more agilely around business and human rights issues uh, and around the around the developments related to UNGP implementation, and and both Debbie and Remy have mentioned uh, the the mandatory and voluntary aspects and and the smart mix, which I'll I'll touch on later briefly, but also to provide companies with the opportunity to share best practice, and and to provide business perspectives to policymakers and to contribute to multi-stakeholder consultations, particularly around the 10, 10 year plus project. We've met four times in this, this uh, informal working group and discussed a range of issues, include those really that are proposed, so it's, it's company driven, including access to remedy and grievance mechanisms, which I know, Anita, you're aware of. And we had a representative of the uh, High Commissioner's office to, to brief companies on, on, uh, on their guidance. And again, this is, as you mentioned, Anita, another area where, where much more needs to be done. So my first remark on, on, on the guidance is that I think it would be very useful, Anita, if we invited you back to the working group, I know you've presented to us before, to brief our members, member companies on the guidance and perhaps also to ask Bennett to join if he were, were available. Uh, I briefed him on, on, on the initiative a few months ago before we started. In, in terms of substance uh, of the guidance, Andres and I have identified a number of areas of, of focus one that stood out to me immediately uh, is the value of using human rights defenders as partners in a company's uh, human rights due diligence strategy. I, and I guess you referred that to that as, as using human rights defenders as allies, uh, Anita. In other words, recognizing that human rights defenders can be and should be indeed uh, important, an important exor, expert resource as part of a, a company's human rights due diligence process enabling companies to make uh, to better understand the communities on the ground and also the concerns of the affected uh, individuals indeed when we were discussing access to remedy and grievance mechanisms in the icc working group one of the companies said that they've been having a lot of issues with their grievance mechanism process or it wasn't being used and they felt there were real 
uh, lack of trust issues. One of the ways they resolved that was to, to uh, uh, get to know the communities on the ground better and to partner with some of the local human rights defenders as an integral, integral part of that grievance mechanism process, uh, which enabled them to, to use these human rights aid, uh, defenders as agents of trust and, and create more transparency. So that, would, that was an interesting lesson learned by that company, which they were able to share with our, our, our working group. One, one other is, is uh, and it seems obvious, but is the importance of an ex explicit commitment to the rights of human rights defenders in a company's human rights due diligence policies and procedures. Uh, but going beyond that, as I think you mentioned, Anita, to, to uh, uh, actually taking concrete steps uh, and including in, in, in management uh, responsibilities and making that transparent and, and clear what people's roles are and what their responsibilities are. Um, one, one other issue that I think is, is increasingly important, again, it, it seems perhaps obvious and something that Andres and I've already started talking about is how to increase communication between companies and human rights defenders. Uh, it's a project that Andres and I would like to, to take further. I think um, building that communication uh, and I think getting, creating an understanding that we should be both uh, on the same side on these issues. That's certainly uh, my perspective. And I know within our working group, uh, there are already companies that take that position. And I would like on this issue as with others to use uh, ICC's network and scale uh, to, to share some of these, uh, these perspectives and you know, build understanding about, uh, uh, throughout our network um, in the future. So look, let, let me leave it there, but I, I just before I, I conclude, um, so a, a few words on, on the, the, the smart mix that, uh, and, and, and the voluntary and mandatory uh, issue that, that Debbie, you mentioned, and, and uh, Remy, you did as well. It, it, it's one of the reasons why we created uh, the working group a few months ago, because there was certainly a feeling of, in our membership that we weren't addressing uh, adequately, we weren't providing sufficient business input in, into the, the discussion around the smart mix. And it certainly is something that many of our members actively support. And Anita, you know that, you've heard many of the members of the working group actively supporting mandatory human rights due diligence. Uh, equally within our network, and we have a network of over, over 45 million companies, as I mentioned, there are some companies that are not so persuaded and uh, whether they're smaller or, or in different geographies, uh, worried about uh, the burden or what liabilities might lead to. But it's our role as a, a, a forward-looking purpose-driven uh, business organization to, to get those messages out uh, and, and share those sorts of, um, share the understanding and if necessary, provide tools to those, the, those companies. So just to, to reiterate that, you know, we're not shying away from that discussion. In fact, we want to be more actively involved. We think that if, if um, a smart mix is going to have impact, it needs to not just be a box ticking exercise. It needs to be something where companies are actively involved and where we can share uh, best practice with policymakers and to, uh, together on a multi-stakeholder uh, um, exercise, identify what can really make an impact, impact on the ground and how we do that. So I look forward to, uh, to working with, with many of you to take these uh, issues forward. Uh, and as I said also, uh, earlier to, to, to really use the ICC's global network uh, to, to amplify some of the messages, Anita, that, that uh, are coming through the, the guidance that you've released. So thank you again, Andres, for this opportunity. Great, thank you, Crispin, for such a um, positive message and, and, and progressive look into the future, into the next 10 years, what's coming in the next decade. Um, it's one of the questions that we will pose in at the beginning of the event. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's quite um, a constructive perspective, the one about building bridges between civil society and businesses. What needs to happen between those uh, two collectives, right, to, to, to kind of uh, eat that legacy of mistrust and lack of communication. Uh, 
Is there value for businesses in engaging with civil society? Is there like uh, some practical measures that they can take into the risk assessment? How can they become better actors of society? Some of the questions that we that remain here and that we have touched upon a few years ago already in a in a very uh, complete and and for me uh, game changing report that. Um, that we published at ICHR together with the B team and the Business and Human Rights Resource Center. And this links with our uh, section on, on comments and questions. I think there are some questions in the chat, but first I would like to give the, 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 the floor uh, to Bennett Freeman, who is among our uh, attendees today. Uh, it was mentioned uh, earlier. He was one of the co-authors of, of, of the report that I mentioned and I put the link in the chat. I'm one of the promoters of, of this approach I would say globally in, in conversations with, with many of our, the, the most progressive businesses at the international level and trying to push this discourse. So uh, Bennett, I think you, you will be able to, to have the floor open for you now. So if you have any, any views on, on the comments made and then we can jump to further questions. The floor is yours, Bennett. Hopefully we can open the mic uh, to him. Ah, uh, yeah, there we go. Apologies for that. All right, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Now we can see you as a as a speaker. Sorry for the momentary delay. I've got a slow connection from a island off Rhode Island. But thank you very much, Andres. Uh, appreciate the chance to offer a brief comment. Um, first, I just really want to congratulate my longtime friend and colleague of over two decades, Anita Ramasastri, for her leadership with the working group of producing this timely report. And um, I would note that today's discussion comes just a day after uh, one of the co-conspirators, a CEO of a hydroelectric company in Honduras, was convicted. Um, for masterminding the assassination of Berta Kacharis um, in Honduras. Um, a very timely reminder of the deadly stakes here uh, with business and human rights defenders. Uh, I really appreciate um, the uh, further contribution embodied in this um, uh, new guidance from the working group. I think it very much complements what we did um, in the shared space under pressure report published, as you say, Andres, in 2018. Uh, I think it certainly reinforces the contention in that report that companies have a normative responsibility to support human rights defenders, especially um, when uh, companies may cause, contribute, or be directly linked to a harm or threat related to defenders. Uh, and the new guidance also um, reinforces um, the observations we made about the business case, as well as the moral choice. I would simply just observe further that uh, over the past two or three years, um, this whole agenda has moved forward, not just with respect to human rights defenders, but more broadly, um, civic space. And I really appreciate Remy um, underlining uh, that theme as well. The two really go hand in hand. I would note also that um, in addition to Adidas, which adopted, as far as I'm aware, the first standalone explicit company uh, uh, policy explicitly addressing human rights defenders back in 2017. There have been several other major companies um, in the last year who have uh, published uh, such explicit policy commitments. And those companies include H&M, BP, and Facebook. And I'm aware of several other major uh, multinationals um, that are developing such policies. But what's even more important than the policies, of course, is the willingness to act. And we certainly are aware of the obstacles, the dilemmas the companies face, but they've just got to recognize this responsibility to support defenders, not to undermine them, to work together uh, and uh, overcome this legacy of distrust. And at the same time, thread a very careful needle at times in engaging and frankly, when necessary, uh, crossing swords um, uh, with host country governments to support defenders and civic freedoms. And that's often 
done privately and I think more effectively in, in many situations. But we've sure got our work cut out for us. And I just want to, uh, again, commend Anita and the working group. And I hope that there can be significant uptake of this new guidance on top of shared space and the uh, uh, analytical framework, decision framework that that uh, prior report offers to companies. So thank you very much, Andres, for the chance to contribute that comment. No, thank you, Bennett, for, for joining and for sharing your thoughts. Uh, I think this debate restarts, gets new energy from the publication of this guidance. And I think we will have the chance to hopefully work on implementation together with progressive private actors like Chris Pien and IDICC and hopefully more coming to the table. I think now uh, it, it, it's also, we, we have in the room uh, Carlos Lopez as well, who was uh, very kind to join us from the International Commission of Jurists. And I think he would also like to, to make a brief comment and then we can jump into some other questions. Carlos, go ahead. Um, hello. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity, Andres. And uh, also thank you to the organizers and the, and the panelists for their uh, thoughts uh, uh, on the presentation of this important report. Uh, thanks, uh, of course, for giving me a couple of minutes to make uh, some remarks as a co-organizer, co-sponsoring organization of this event. We appreciate very much the working group report and the and the guidance that it has provided, and we hope it will be used. And a first uh, view already, uh, or overview of its content already highlights or reveals a very useful, relevant uh, guidance that will help uh, uh, states and, and businesses to respect and protect uh, human rights defenders. Uh, we appreciate in particular uh, the fact that uh, after each guide, there are, and there are a number of illustrative steps that can be taken by states and businesses to implement uh, those uh, guidance. Um, if anything, uh, from our side, we would like to highlight further is the paradigm shift that the working group is proposing in the relationship between business and human rights defenders. That uh, businesses have to stop seeing critical NGOs, critical civil society and members of community as the enemies, as the adversaries that they need to confront and keep at bay. And actually, this is something we wholeheartedly support as a statement by the working group. It's something that we also have uh, proposed in our own reports two years ago. The International Commission of Jurists uh, published our report, uh, uh, comparative studies of several experiences of uh, company grievance mechanisms. And one of our key recommendations was exactly that, you know, uh, grievance mechanisms, if they're going to be legitimate and effective, they have to be relying very strongly on participation, on free participation by the stakeholders, and in particular, the community, human rights defenders, unions, workers. They are not your enemies, they are key partners, key associates. And, uh, and it is without the participation, there is no legitimacy, there is no effectiveness. So this is what we said, and uh, we, uh, we are glad, of course, that the working group has arrived to similar conclusions and is promoting the same. Now, um, to finish uh, my short remarks and address, um, I would like to pose a couple of questions, perhaps, to the panelists so that, to give some food for the discussion. Um, for us, uh, the key on, on all guidance and the standard setting is always, uh, or recommendations uh, for that matter, is always an implementation. No? And uh, an implementation is key. So my question is, what plans have, has the working group or the business association to uh, monitor on the implementation of uh, the report and, uh, and, uh, and ensure and um, promote compliance with it? by its members uh, and by states, including in the case of the working group. And the second question will be, if the panelists could expand a little bit more on the role of human rights defenders in enabling um, uh, and ensuring uh, those that are affected negatively by uh, business operations and the right uh, to have access to an effective remedy of a judicial nature. Thank you very much. 
Thanks so much, Carlos. And that's a, a good way to transition to the question uh, period. We have a good 12, 13 minutes. So um, we can start with those questions if anyone wants to take them about implementation and access to remedy. Um, any volunteer from, from the panel? Well, Go ahead. I'll, I'll speak to Carlos. Thank you so much for your for your um, provocative question. Um, the working group, as you know, is of course a group of five individuals who have who are volunteers actually. Um, but what our job is to, I think, help clarify expectations based on outreach and consultation. But then to work to plant the seeds and really move other people forward um, in implementation and action. So when it comes to the defender guidance, one of the things that it, our role is is engaging with states both collectively now, which is one of the things I'll be doing over the next few months, but through our country visits to say, what are the steps that you're taking specifically around defenders through your national action plans, through your legislation, to the extent we're talking about mandatory human rights due diligence? Are we thinking about defenders as part of that in terms of consultation with them, protection of them, remedy, etc.? So there, we will have a plan for how to sort of embed this in terms of states. Um, and similarly, with respect to companies, it, it will be our role to bring this to business associations and to companies and then ask them, what have you been doing? Um, that is within our capability, is to create the expectations and then to move forward and to use leverage to try to, to create uh, further action. But, you're, but I would say that one area, for example, where we need a lot more implementation is in, in the role of the judiciary um, and in the courts. And of course, in the area, Debbie mentioned you know, slap lawsuits and there's criminalization. This is one of the biggest areas where we need much more action immediately. So we're talking now to UNDP and other partners in the Resource Center around the judiciary as one missing link. And that's a place where I think ICJ can play a really, really critical role. So I'll stop there just to say again, we need partners for implementation and we need your leverage to make this actually something that makes a difference. So thank you. Sorry, Crispin, go ahead. Yeah. Just to volunteer and thank you, Carlos, for, for those remarks and also for sponsoring this this event. <clears throat> I, I think you know, Anita and the working group do a wonderful job, and you know, as Anita said, they'll be reaching out to partners, and and we will be one of those partners. Uh, and uh, we we have a very broad network, and you know, we will utilize that network to to spread out, spread the messaging from the, from the guidance. There are a number of ways of doing that. First of all, through our, our, our new newly formed working group, and then going beyond that through our, our commission that I mentioned earlier, and then through our national committees. So I think I think there are a number of ways that we can can work to do this. But and then in I think in also standalone activities, where we can start chipping away at that that uh, lack of of trust and bringing uh, parties together. I mean, it, it seems to me obvious that that uh, a company should be looking to uh, human rights defenders as, as allies. But uh, I think it, you know, there needs to be engagement and, and uh, willingness on, on both sides. Uh, and you know, I think the guidance provides us with a, a very useful motivating factor to start uh, working more on that. Right. Uh, thanks. I think something that also is, is quite important, I would say, like it's a, at the translation of the guidance as well into, uh, you know, like a, uh, something motivating for companies to 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 stress further stress that that value that the guidance speaks about uh, of civil, engaging with civil society, being open, uh, giving them a seat at the table. Uh, that's quite important as well as how we it, how businesses and other actors communicate about human rights defenders and how that, that stigmatization that has been established in some in some instances. So that's quite important. It's a long-term cultural, let's say, uh, fight that, that we have to start uh, as soon as possible. And, and we are really happy to to start using the guidance and other resources. Um, let me, uh, I don't know if Debbie, you had other reflections on that point or um, otherwise we, we jump to some of the questions yeah, in the chat. I think, uh, um... Uh, it's so great to be on this on this panel with Carlos and uh, the other panelists, but also with Carlos and Bennett. But um, um, you know, at, at the grassroots, sometimes even uh, providing trainings and knowledge building on frameworks to gain access to remedy, uh, judicial and non-judicial remedy, is something that's quite important because 
most of the communities are not um, not impart, not given that knowledge that they actually have the right to say no. That there's actually a question of consent, and that there are, there are uh, potential remedies to be pursued. But very often, civil society also uh, um, has has to respond and help coordinate the legal defense when human rights defenders or community leaders are subjected to criminalization or slap suit lawsuits on the ground. And, 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 and that's, that's where they often provide the bridge as well. So I think we, we know that, that this is happening. And I noticed that the question from Laos on the Belt and Road Initiative, this is a very grave concern in, uh, in, in Myanmar, in, uh, in very various parts of Asia, especially in countries where there's very little regulation and protection, including in Kyrgyzstan, because the gold mine that's uh, named by Tolakan, that case, uh, is is an example of the fact that co most people cannot leave home because of COVID, but yet these corporations can still undertake very harmful operations and even scale up the operations in some cases. So we there's a there's a there's a lot of work being done um, in, at local, national, and international level, and um, and it's uh, really important to have. Um, partners, including in the corporate sector, um, who are willing to actually do the advocacy and make the call to say, "Hey, what's happening?" Because companies still have, we still don't have, we still, uh, we still need to work for that cultural shift that the working group is talking about, about how human rights defenders are viewed by states and corporations. And um, and uh, and for that cultural shift to happen, the other cultural shift that we haven't yet addressed is the fact that businesses tend to ignore or slow down uh, stakeholder engagement um, and only uh, spring to act if there is a crisis. So the crisis mindset also tells us as human rights defenders that we have to highlight the situation as a crisis. While we, you know, in some cases, there's been like 10 years of talking to the business, uh, to the particular industry, nothing moves. And then there's a public crisis and, uh, and orders are cut. And then suddenly we have a multi-stakeholder engagement. People are springing to action when they previously said, yeah, we know it's a problem, but we don't know what to do. There's nothing we can do about it. So I think that that political will also is part of the cultural shift. Thanks, thanks, Debbie. Very practical reflections and, and how to change that mindset in, in, in businesses from only seeing the risk of legal liability and in, in, in engaging in engaging sometimes civil society, right? Like uh, I think there's far more value to see there than uh, some, some businesses sometimes tend to see. Um, any further reflections on the questions on the table uh, before we, there was one about uh, national action plans that um, how how the guidance builds on on onto those those processes. We have uh, around four minutes, so please anyone in the panel, if if they feel like taking some of the questions that we see in the chat, um, please go ahead and just take the floor. I think there are just several questions, and Debbie, I think, has done a great job, Debbie, of answering them and also answering them having read the guidance. So you get like the gold star for today. But I think the, the, the guidance is about practical steps, and there have been questions about impunity and risk prevention. That is the whole idea of this, right? That it is, if we get back to basics and we don't see this as crisis management, but about beginning holistically with seeing defenders as the critical partner and ensuring we understand impacts on the ground that we would be preventing everything that we are now addressing here. And that businesses, you know, even if they are not the ones that are actually directly perpetrating the violence, are connected to it in so many situations, that there is at least linkage, if not more, in many of these situations. And so really accepting that responsibility and speaking up and standing up needs to take place. And so I'm so glad to see that everybody here agrees that we need a culture shift because the working groups, I think, strongest experience has been that very often while leadership um, back in company headquarters may speak strongly in support of defenders, when we actually talk to managers and, and, and people who are in field operations for companies, you have a very different narrative around what they see and how they portray people who are simply trying to say, here are the harms that we're experiencing 
please work with us to deal with them. And so this is the piece that we're trying to counter. And you know, again, the guidance is just meant to be concrete steps that we can then take forward and ask other people um, to, to join us in that journey. Um, so I just want to thank um, for all of the panelists and, and Bennett and Carlos as well for their reflections, because again, we already have uh, amongst this group a multi-stakeholder commitment um, to these issues. And Andres, of course, through the business network, um, an even stronger and earlier uh, step in this direction. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, we have a couple of minutes. I don't know if you you have an intervention, Remy. You wanna you wanna come in, and then uh, we we wrap up. Thanks. No, thank you. Just underlining what uh, Debbie and Danita just said in terms of uh, the importance of partnering and having straight having strong message coming from the top down to the operations of, of, of companies. I mean, we we are a growing, I would say, group of uh, like-minded companies, civil society representatives. And, uh, and companies that uh, know the importance of acting responsibly and that are seeing human rights defenders, not that people who are, that are living in the, in the margins, but the central actors uh, related to, to operations of, of companies that may be affected by them, but can also benefit uh, from, from economic activities. So um, getting this message through, I think it's a responsibility that needs to come from the top and maybe we should find, find ways on how uh, have the better engagement with, between human rights defenders and the uh, top level management of, of, of companies. So that's uh, a message of, of something to explore. Uh, that's good. I think that's a, it's a good uh, closing message from, from the panel. I, let me wrap up in like one minute highlighting some of the key messages that we heard today uh, before closing. I think uh, in a context of, of a COVID pandemic, we have seen growing pressure on, on human rights defenders. We all agree that there's been like a bit of a curtain and, and some level of distraction and more even tension for the, for the civic space in which uh, human rights defenders operate and civil society pushing. We are pushing for, for that knowledge, that kind of idea of, of, of civic space shared with businesses, the value of civil society as early warning uh, actors as, as constructive and not confrontational. And we need to build that culture in communications, in narratives, but also in reality, in building, building those tables. We heard from, from Anita about the new guidance and the, the new elements that, that that brings together. And I think how it systematizes and, and brings them in one package, I think that's inviolable and serves us as a continuation of our, let's say, shared space report under pressure that we released a couple of years ago. And I think Crispin also like uh, you, you highlighted a few, few very progressive ideas there um, to put um, policies in place, con like explicit commitments to respect the rights of human rights defenders. And, and, and something that I think I, I really liked was the converting those policies into management systems, allocating responsibilities, not only uh, having kind of a, a message, but rather a system, how that that works internally, showing that that commitment is real. But we continue to see some of the challenges related to, to slabs and the suppression of, of yeah, civic liberties and, and expression. A lot, yeah, closing one minute uh, over the time, but a lot of work to do. I'm really happy that we were joined today by Bennett Freeman as well, the author of, the, of our report. Carlos, thanks so much. Thanks to all our panelists. And I think this is kind of the, the start of a longer race on implementation that everyone in this webinar and, and out are willing to really looking forward to, to see. Please don't, don't hesitate to, to reach out. I think you have email addresses uh, and Twitter accounts and everything out there. So show your messages and, and thanks so much for joining.